Thank you, uh, Callum and Tony and uh, Chris and the team for giving us the opportunity. We've got, uh, you've stayed for the right reason. This is uh, a blockbuster panel that's going to cover an amazing series of discussions in an area that's often, often uh, underappreciated, underdiagnosed, uh, inappropriately or often mistreated, and the outcomes are, are potentially devastating to uh, limb life, uh, quality of life, etc. And um, I think one of the challenges that we're facing in our perspectives that you'll hear uh, over the next hour or so is that there are so many new technologies that have exploded onto the scene and yet we're still really not sure which one fits where, in whom, how often, and by the way, can we pay for it? And so uh, we've really put together an incredible panel, and I'm very grateful to the course organizers for letting us uh, speak with you this afternoon. So let me introduce this panel. Uh, not that they really need an introduction, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, Doug Drackman, a colleague and good friend who we share many a patient together, uh, Director of Cardiology and Interventional Cardiology Fellowship Programs at Mass General Hospital, and an Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Tamara Syrick Jensen, who's the Director of Coverage and Analysis at CMS, so uh, obviously a, a very important person to this entire dialogue. Uh, Dr. Misty Malone, the Chief of the Peripheral Interventions Devices Branch at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Um, had a chance to work with Misty many times in my career in a number of different uh, venues and thrilled to have you here. Shad Marzouk, Dr. Shad Marzouk, who's the Chief Medical Officer at Cardinal Health um, and a neurosurgeon, actually, by training. So uh, interesting perspectives to bring to the table. Uh, Dr. Matt Menard, uh, who's the co-director of the Endovascular Surgery Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. And just to add a little heat to, uh, to uh, Matt, and he's thinking about his comments, he's uh, co-running one of the most important uh, NIH clinical trials in the space that we will see and we'll hear about this uh, this afternoon. And then finally, Jeff Mervis, who's a senior vice president and president of peripheral interventions at Boston Scientific. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining me this afternoon. Uh, I want to start off with uh, Doug and Matt to set the stage for those of you who are either involved in this field and are wondering what the future looks like or those thinking about uh, dabbling in this. Why is why is this such a tough disorder? Doug, I'll start with you. So let, let's just first think about what's the impact of PAD on patients? Why do we even worry about this disorder as an atherosclerotic syndrome? Uh, thanks, Michael. It's an honor to lead off. And I would say that uh, first and foremost, peripheral artery disease is a scourge. It's present in over 9 million Americans. And above the age of 70, about 20% of individuals in this country will have peripheral artery disease. Across the world, 200 million people have PAD, and that's grown by about 25% just in the past decade. The things that lead to PAD are the same things that we see with coronary disease, which are smoking, diabetes, hypertension, the usual cardiovascular risk factors. And from a perspective of a patient or an individual who suffers from peripheral artery disease, it can be really disabling. Claudication, which is the manifestation of PAD, is often described as a discomfort or a pain in the calf muscle or maybe migrating upwards to the upper leg or buttocks. And it can be so severe that it can disable people from perhaps their professions or just enjoying quality of life. And when it progresses further, it can lead even to rest symptoms or breakdown of the skin and the tissues and the feet, which is critical in ischemia, which is going to be in large part, I think, the focus of what we discuss <laughs> here today. From the viewpoint of society, I think that PAD is incredibly underrecognized. When you cold call people above the age of 50 across the country, as the PAD coalition did, and ask them, do you know what PAD is? About 25% of people will say, yes, I know what PAD is. But if you ask the same people if they know what Lou Gehrig's disease is, or what cystic fibrosis is, or um, multiple sclerosis, a much larger number, 30 40% or even more. And this was before the ice bucket challenge. So I think now probably many people know what Lou Gehrig's disease is who didn't before. Yet when you look at how many patients have those diseases, that's about 50,000 people in the country, and there's 9 million who have PAD. So I think that we really need to meet this sort of unmet gap right now and understand 
or have our society even understand the implications of PAD. What's so worrisome about PAD is just that nuisance cramping in the calf muscle actually portends a terribly sinister prognosis to people who have PAD. Once a diagnosis is made in someone above the age of 65 with PAD, there's about a 30% chance that they'll die within the next five years. So it's an incredibly morbid and mortal disease process, but is under-recognized. It's actually more dangerous to have PAD than it is to have had a prior myocardial infarction. And so I think that this is really important. It's actually a worse mortality than breast cancer, Hodgkin's disease, or many celebrated diseases that have true, I think, <clears throat> advocacy across the country. So I think we have to kind of get on our own respective soapboxes and really proselytize <laughs> that it's important to recognize people with PAD and to help to, to eradicate this disease. And you know, Doug, when you hear about uh, your comments, it's hard to recognize the fact that numerous studies have suggested that patients with PAD receive far inferior amounts of anti-atherosclerotic medical therapy than their patients with coronary disease. And so here's a population that's under-recognized, under-treated, not only from a lifestyle standpoint, but from a survival standpoint. So Matt, um, why is this such a hard disease to effectively treat and durably treat? I mean, what is it about PAD that makes it so hard to give a patient a successful and durable outcome? Yeah, so it's a great question. And again, thanks for uh, the privilege of being here. So I think the answer really lies in the, the tremendous tendency for it to recur. So you can have a successful outcome, follow the patient for a certain amount of time, and it's been described as vascular cancer, <clears throat> and it really is vascular cancer. In, in effect, we don't, we don't typically cure a patient. We just manage their burden of disease and expect that they're going to have uh, some different manifestation of it over time. So durability is going to be central to this focus of any, of any technology or any treatment that we we utilize, but that's really, I think, underlies the challenge. So it doesn't do a, a patient uh, particular good to have a, a result that might last a month or, or two months or even three months when their disease could easily uh, recur and, and uh, cause problems uh, multiple times down the line. So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, of inherent inherent challenges. Doug uh, did a great job of sort of laying the framework. I think across the country and across the globe, the biggest challenge is do we have the resources to, to treat it? Uh, do we understand the best treatments, as, as you uh, alluded to? And do we have the money uh, or the resources to actually um, treat it once we do know those answers? So there's just across the board a whole myriad uh, challenges inherent to PAD. So we're going to delve into this. I want to uh, ask Jeff Mervis to start uh, with the remainder of the panelists, kind of just giving your perspectives to the audience on a simple but important question. Why do you focus on PAD in your specific environment? So Jeff is a major medical device manufacturer who's clearly made its uh, point about PAD being important to you, what, what is it about it to you in Boston Scientific that matters? Yeah, so I think first of all, it was touched on already, which is um, the enormous opportunity to help patients. So obviously, at Boston Scientific and many of the companies in the field, you know, that, that's what our mission is, is to, is to help patients. And the more we can do that, uh, the more the business stuff really uh, takes care of itself. And so, you know, we're just you know, enormously optimistic about the future of being able to bring meaningful innovations to patients with PAD. And I think there's a lot of room for us to innovate. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, patients are out there that need treatment, but the, the treatment modalities today can be improved. I think we're now just uh, have introduced anti-proliferative therapies uh, for peripheral disease. We know in the coronaries, it's been around quite a while and have really uh, proved uh, very efficacious and very cost effective. And I think if we use that as a corollary, although the disease state is very different, but if we use that as a corollary to, to where we could go for patients with PAD, 
Um, you know, we look at that as just a, a great opportunity to help, help patients. Um, I also would add just, you know, to tag on to the two physicians that, you know, we call it PAD as if it's uh, a singular thing or, uh, you know, one entity. When you really, when you look at the vessels in the leg, they are very different. Above the knee is very different than below the knee. There are many different arteries that may require different treatment modalities. And I think the peripheral field has been fairly characterized as a field uh, with a paucity of data. And we're trying to change that by investing in, t in the type of data that can advance the field forward and bring more evidence so that physicians and hospitals and, and payers can practice more evidence-based medicine. And I think you know, we're on the precipice of being able to do that with new innovations, uh, as well as the data to support those innovations. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Shad and Cardinal Health is a relatively uh, new entrant into the uh, space, and I wonder if you could give us your perspective. What interested Cardinal Health in getting into the, into the vascular realm? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. I would say uh, several things. First of all, this is, as everyone has already discussed, a very big and complicated problem with clinical and economic effects, a societal problem. Um, the cordis is part of our portfolio. Obviously, peripheral artery disease is a significant portion of what cordis items are used to treat. But if we elevate the discussion, you know, we hear there's 200 million patients worldwide. We hear that there is no perfect treatment, which is absolutely true. So when we think about a problem that has clinical and economic effects, societal effects, it's multidisciplinary in terms of the treatment for these patients, these are reasons that we're interested in helping PAD patients and health systems. And on a personal note, as a neurosurgeon, there's times where we've had to differentiate between neurogenic claudication and vascular claudication, and I've seen the journey that PAD patients go on, including their chronic wounds. So again, a very impactful problem with many unmet needs. Uh, Dr. Malone, uh, looking at it from the FDA's perspective, you see a lot of clinical trials come across your office that are looking at ways to get therapies out to the marketplace. What are the unique challenges that you see in PAD device trials in general that, that you think everybody here ought to hear about from your perspective? So I believe that the physicians have uh, stressed this several times is the heterogeneity in this area of uh, clinical specialties, patient characteristics, um, and the treatment for the, these patients and the outcomes, and there's a lack of data available. So uh, getting devices or even drugs to the market, I, I stress collaboration with the FDA. I stress um, creating quality data and consistency of a clinical trial. So those are important to design a trial that will yield meaningful data because I think at this point, we, we still aren't completely sure what the expectations are, what the, the, what the data will be in the very end. So is patency important to the patient? Probably, probably not, probably amputation, probably um, their quality of life. And so collecting all these endpoints that so you can, companies can meet the regulatory bar, can overcome the regulatory bar, would be important, so, which is why we stress collaboration with the FDA, and we typically will reach out and work with our colleagues at NIH and CMS to help develop meaningful trials. So, Tamara, what about from a payment standpoint? Um, I can tell you that in my career, it really wasn't until the past maybe five to seven years where we really started thinking proactively about coverage for therapies specific to PAD, but now, quite frankly, we've learned that we think about that right off the bat. What is it about the reimbursement strategies around PAD therapies that we ought to be thinking about as a community? Well, I think, well, first of all, I think that you and the community trying to advocate for peripheral artery disease, and what I heard you say, has really meant a lot to CMS. We had a MedCAC along, or a Medicare Evidence Development Advisory Committee along around the disease, what were the right outcomes we needed to look at, and then I think there were a variety of meetings that occurred. And because of all of that, we did issue a national coverage determination. Uh, there is a lot of evidence out there for some treatments for peripheral artery disease, and so we just issued a proposed 
about six months ago just for uh, supervised exercise therapy. And, and to, because Medicare hasn't paid for that. And I think it's one of the first steps and it's you know, fairly an easy way for us to help move the uh, treatment for this disease in the right direction. And I think that's very important that we as a payer collaborate more with the community to try to get to the problem that you just talked about. Um, that it's, you know, it's not out there, that not, people are not talking about it. So we issued that proposed decision and then the final decision is due in two weeks. I think it's May 31st that it's due. Uh, and we are working that through the system to make that public so that it will be final and Medicare will pay for at least that, that treatment for peripheral artery disease. So I can tell you, uh, as somebody who spent a good portion of his career studying the role of exercise in patients with claudication, this is a game changer for us. Uh, can you imagine that uh, a therapy that's been studied for 20 years with countless trials showing dramatic improvements in walking distance in patients with claudication. We've had trouble getting patients to adhere to it, largely because we've not been able to enroll them in programs that supervise them, kind of like cardiac rehab. So it may not seem groundbreaking to all of you, but it's certainly very meaningful to us <clears throat> and to all our patients. So Tamara, if there's a lesson for us to learn from this experience, how did this actually come to CMS's attention now, six months ago, to say, hey, you know what, this is an important therapy. We need to consider our position on this. So I, I really think it's the folks that are sitting at this panel. It's everybody that's in this audience. It's, it's bringing it to our attention. Um, you know, we, we want to engage. We want to know what we're supposed to focus on. In the coverage group, we have 40 people, so we don't get to everything, so it really is bringing it to our attention. I will say that my deputy, Dr. Joe Chin, this was a real issue for him. He was very passionate about it. So when they brought it to his attention, he really has worked very hard over the last few years to try to just make small steps to put certain incentives, at least in the payment system, to again, to move everybody in the right direction to start talking about it. So that's why we had that public meeting, to just to get people talking about it. And one of the advantages of that meeting is a lot of societies got together and they wrote a paper and that was really helpful. So that got the ball rolling. It is not the end. It really is the very, very beginning. And so now once we get the final out, we need to talk about, okay, what are our next steps? What else do we need to do to move this again in the right direction? And, and it, whatever therapy it is, we do work very closely with our FDA colleagues and our NIH colleagues. And so it's, it's really engaging with all three of them. And if you engage with the FDA, usually Misty will call us so that we can be part of those conversations. So it's just reaching out to, to all of us so that we can help move everything where it needs to be. And I can tell you from my own perspective, uh, it's been a very rewarding part of my career to have the preconceived notion that it's hard to interact with government officials and actually figure out ways to do it in a very effective way. This has been really rewarding for me and I congratulate CMS for having the foresight to uh, pursue this. So now well, let's get to the hard part. So when you design a clinical trial for a device to improve wound healing in a patient with bad peripheral artery disease and critical limb ischemia, for example, one of the hard parts about this is maybe not the device itself, and maybe it's not even the clinical trial, but it's all the care that goes around the patient to make sure that you can compare apples to apples, particularly in a randomized trial. So Doug, you know where I'm driving at here. I'm talking about things like wound care after a successful revascularization. And so this might seem mundane and kind of ho-hum to all of you, but let me tell you, this has been a very, very serious limitation to all of us as doctors and trialists thinking about what to propose to the FDA and CMS. And Doug, what is it about this aspect of clinical trials in PAD and CLI that's been so hard? Why can't we get this together? I think that's a really uh, pertinent question because, um, you know, I think as Misty was indicating, this is exactly what we have to demonstrate can be effective, is that the wound is healed, the patient doesn't require the amputation. And as you mentioned, it's not just about making a vessel open and improving blood flow to the target territory. There's profound heterogeneity of the patients that we examine. Someone who is enrolled in a clinical trial because they have an ulcer in the skin only at the most distal or terminal aspect of the great toe, 
is different than someone who has an ulcer in their heel that penetrates down to the bone with infection at the bone. Restoring blood flow to the former patient may improve the ability of the skin to heal, and having a durably patent vessel may enable that just to recover, even without maybe necessarily sophisticated wound care. But someone who's got a penetrating ulcer down to bone and an infection is going to require a team-based care and a number of subspecialists who can all kind of focus on how to get this patient well, whether it's through antibiotics, whether it's through topical administration of ointments that will enable or encourage skin to grow, or whether it's debridement of the wound, or maybe a partial amputation, or even a below-the-knee amputation in a patient like that. So our expectations solely based on the patient presentation has to be changed, and we can't just lump all the patients together and say therapy does or doesn't work. So this is so vitally important in order to demonstrate that a technology might work or not. And I think that this is what confounds a lot of our clinical trials personally. If I, can I just add on to that? Sure, Jeff. I think what makes it even more complicated is the heterogeneity in the way that the wounds are cared for. So there isn't a consistency in the wound care across institution to institution. So in working on a randomized trial with 50 centers, you have the heterogeneity that you talked about, and then layered on top of that is the wounds are cared for in many, many different ways. And so, um, you know, it's a challenge to have that consistency, as well as the fact that if you have a, a certain device, um, and the, this is a multifactorial disease state, it's hard to imagine that a singular device would be able to kind of fix the downstream effects of, of, of wound care heter heterogeneity. So. It is a pretty complex um, uh, uh, state to figure out a, a clinical trial that can enroll reasonably quickly and have predictable results. So it's kind of complexity on top of complexity, I think, which is maybe why we haven't seen you know, a lot of uh, accelerated innovations, in, especially in the BTK space. So uh, Misty, hearing that, and I know you've thought about this, how does the FDA approach clinical trial designs for devices that are designed specifically to get people out of a limb-threatening situation, to get a foot to heal or an amputation site to heal? So for many of our below-the-trial designs right now, due to the challenges associated with teasing out a signal among the noise, uh, we are currently recommending randomized control trials in order to match patients, match uh, treatments, and uh, honestly, just to tease out a signal, whether it's positive or not, in order to gather meaningful data. And so um, we work with companies in the space. We have multiple innovation pathways in which a company can come to us or an investigator, um, a physician who may have an idea, can come to us early and we help in the uh, device evaluation strategy from beginning to end to help make the process as efficient as possible. We don't want companies doing extra tests that they may not need at this moment, though they may, be want, they may want to do them on their own to understand more about their device. We want this to be an efficient process to bring the devices to the market as quickly as possible and to bring safe and effective devices to the market. So in this space, due to the unmet clinical need, we may be willing to uh, accept different levels of risks or benefits, and we're always happy to discuss that. There's, there's no standard bar to jump for the FDA. It depends on your particular treatment, your particular benefit, and what you are hoping to uh, gain from your trial and your labeling claims. So we're willing to work within our boundaries to help m make the process more efficient and more reliable. Can I add to that? Please. So um, just to add on to that, if you do go to the FDA, I would also recommend reaching out to CMS because we are also interested in similar outcomes. But you, it would be if you're designing your trial, streamline it as best you can. Make it really effective or efficient, I should say, so that you understand what health outcomes we may be interested in. So as you go through the FDA, and there are a lot of programs for that, for example, parallel review. But if you don't want to be parallel review, there can be informal <laughs> conversations with FDA and CMS at the same time, so that you understand what we would look like for reimbursement and coverage purposes. And I think that is really helpful. 
And it's ultimately a business decision in the end if you want to add these things to that CMS may be interested in your trial. But I think at least you'll, you'll know them up front versus after you get to the FDA, what does CMS want and how are we going to handle this particular new therapy when it comes across our desk. It's nice, it would be better to know that earlier rather than later. All right, so that, that message is loud and clear, but let me, uh, let me shake the stick a little bit. Uh, Misty, I can tell you that doing a randomized clinical trial in CLI is a bear. And there are all sorts of reasons that I'm sure you've heard every single one about why it's almost a non-starter. Now, I'm not going to put Shadden or Jeff on the, on the hot seat here, but how would you respond to that, particularly in this space? <clears throat> so as I mentioned previously, uh, the, one of the reasons we recommend randomized controlled trials, and we, will, we could balance the, the ratio, not necessarily one-to-one, -one, is to tease out the signal. Um, I think it'd be worse if we ended up with a clinical trial with data that was completely uninterpretable. So while it's possible for a company to do that single arm trial, the associated risk with the interpret interpretability of the data <coughs> may be um, worth doing the randomized controlled trial in the very beginning. So we're doing it to help limit the associated risk to companies but also to gather quality data so that it can inform physicians. So while I understand that is it a bear, that's why we're willing to work within our boundaries to balance pre and post market data, to balance what we know uh, thus far, which is fairly limited. The, the current literature may range from what, 20 to 80%, depending on what you look at, which makes it fairly difficult to define a performance goal uh, or an OPC. So we're trying to balance the uh, known and unknown covariates to create meaningful information for both regulatory um, decisions and physician decisions. So Michael, I know this might come as a complete shock, but I'm actually gonna come to the defense of FDA on this. Uh -huh. And you know, uh, reinforce the point about early conversations. And um, I think there is a really healthy dialogue that can be had with FDA on finding the right balance of rigorous science that can move the field forward, but also be the type of science that physicians expect in order to adopt a new technology, but also uh, something that's practical, a trial that can be enrolled with a new technology and leveraging data and leveraging testing, et cetera. And um, it's a hard balance to strike, but I have been extremely pleased with the dialogue. And I think um, openness on FDA's part to try some new things and do things differently uh, as a recognition of A, what a horrible disease state PAD is in general, but uh, specifically CLI patients where you know the standard of care today is either POBA, plain old balloon angioplasty, or primary amputation, as well as just how difficult it is for these patients to live their life uh, and the, the really the, the terrible outcomes. So it's, it's difficult, but I think uh, it can be done, and uh, it's nice to know that FDA kind of gets it, so to speak. It's been very encouraging to hear both uh, Tamara and Misty say collaboration many times. <laughs> we try. So, so Jeff, I'm uh, given that you're being so kumbaya-ish, I'm gonna I'm gonna come after you a bit here. So, obviously, you guys are all in at Boston Scientific and PAD. You've got your from an outsider's view, you're hedging your bets here. You've got a bare metal stent. You've got a next generation drug eluding stent. You've got a drug coated balloon. So, first of all, kind of on a general standpoint, what you know. Why did you decide to approach it this way? How do you rationalize that as a business? And where do you, where do you see this playing out for your company specifically? Yeah. Well, I think it starts with our strategy, uh, which you know, we describe as category leadership. And so while you know, some companies are going you know, for more breadth, we, uh, we want to be a leader in the disease states that we uh, think we can bring our innovations to bear. 
And so we talked about the heterogeneity of PAD, and it's our view that there will never be a singular technology that will work for all patients and all lesions all the time. And so as a result, uh, we want to be the company that provides the portfolio of tools as well as the data to support those tools so physicians can practice the type of evidence-based medicine that they would expect. So maybe in a simple uh, patient with a short lesion, you know, perhaps the lowest cost alternative is best, like a plain old balloon or a bare metal stent for a short focal lesion. And maybe a patient with moderate complexity uh, might be more amenable to something like atherectomy with or without drug-coated balloon or some other technology. And perhaps uh, a very complex patient like a long lesion with calcium or a CTO where a scaffold is required, you know, perhaps that's where a drug eluding stent with sustained drug release is uh, going to show better results. And so we think, you know, our meaningful innovations across the spectrum of disease states will really empower the physician to determine, you know, what's best for their patient versus, you know, somebody coming and saying, hey, we've got this tool and we think it's, you know, it's great for all of your patients. And that's why we're kind of doubling down in the space, both from a meaningful innovation perspective, but also from a significant investment in clinical evidence. So there's a great question from the audience. I think I'm going to have Doug, Matt, and me try and hand. This is a hard one, guys. But I think if I asked Tamara to answer this, she'd never be on a panel with me again. So Tamara, if you want to jump in, you can. But the question uh, to uh, Doug and Matt is, how much should patient accountability come into play to manage disease cost and outcomes? So specifically, are high deductible plans really a solution? So for a chronic disease like peripheral artery disease, in which the cost, particularly in CLI, can, can manifest themselves, if someone's got a high deductible insurance plan, what's their level of responsibility in decision making about therapy and follow-up? Doug, you want to even give a try on that one? Yeah, I mean, there are so many different levels, I think, to try to answer the question. I think first and foremost, <laughs> I think that um, resources invested up front will pay back profoundly over time. So um, I think first, for a patient who has peripheral artery disease to be able to focus on the ounce of prevention, this is incredibly important. You know, my dad always said, he's a neurologist, he always said when there's rust in the basement, there's rust in the attic. So a patient who's got Peripheral artery disease and atheril uh, in their legs probably has it up in the brain and is at risk of stroke and death. So preventive medications, the recognition of these uh, patients early on and use of systemic therapy will, I think, pay off perhaps most. When presenting with critical ischemia, the ability to recognize it for what it is early before they're having um, solely debridements without, for example, revascularization to allow them to heal a wound is also of paramount importance so that a debridement that occurs will not lead to further and further spread of the disease and need for higher and higher amputation and perhaps over time greater costs. So early revascularization, early access to care and recognition that critical ischemia is from arterial insufficiency and of course long-standing preventive care and maintenance I think will be the key. Whether the patient pays for this or not because of what insurance they have I think is a societal issue that we all have to address because the burden of this disease, because of both its prevalence and how incredibly costly repeat interventional procedures can be, um, is also something that we all have to consider. But as we have greater technological advances, training of individuals at multiple centers to work as a team, better revascularization approaches that are more durable, hopefully the cost will come down for this. So I think investing in this upfront is well worth every penny spent. So Matt, this, this goes to perfectly to the trial that you're running. Uh, when you think about a patient who's got a high deductible plan and a limb-threatening, life-threatening situation, and they're faced with a choice, when you don't have the data, how do you actually help them make the decision that not only makes the best sense for their limb and their life, but even for their family's financial future? And so with that, Maybe you can give us kind of your general response and then tell us a little bit about the NIH trial that you're working on. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. And 
as Doug alluded to, it, it touches on so many different levels. I mean, the, the first and foremost is how do we allocate resources across the country for all diseases, but in particular, a, a, a really costly disease like, like uh, PAD and CLI. So at the moment, as a physician, I'm not limited in any way by I do what I think is the best thing to do and in our current structure, for better or for worse, I'm not, I'm not necessarily limited by financial constraints. I'm not sure if that's the best thing for the country, but I think it absolutely highlights the challenge in front of us in terms of any new innovative uh, techniques or products that, that uh, the companies here today bring to the table terms of good old-fashioned surgery. The trial that I'm running is an NIH-sponsored trial comparing surgical bypass uh, versus endovascular therapy. It's a pragmatic trial, so the investigators are allowed to do whatever it is they do. And that's very different than trials that define a particular endovascular platform. The, the risk is that is uh, there's so much variability that the applicability of that to general practice would be quite limited. So. It makes for a messier trial. It's, it's analogous to the discussion about wounds. There's at least 50 wound care products in, in terms of trying to nail down what's best or, or how does that particular piece of the pie affect outcome is incredibly challenging. But to get back to the question, you know, a big part of the trial that I'm running and I think we all struggle with is cost effectiveness. And that's really what it all comes down to. You can have a fantastic new product, uh, be it a new atherectomy device or, or a new drug eluding technology, and, it, and if it's priced such to to not be cost effective, you know, or, or you're doing society or any of us any good, and so that's the the real challenge. And hopefully, the trial we're running will will provide some answers in that challenge, but I think that's exactly what CMS struggles with on a daily basis and FDA to some extent as well, but uh, it really gets to the heart of, of what we all want and what the challenge is uh, before us. So, Michael, can I? Please. I'm not going to answer about high deductible because that's not my area of expertise, but one of the areas that CMS is working in a little different is patient shared decision making. This is something that's very important to us using evidence-based tools because we do believe that the patient needs to be part of the conversation. And I'm not sure the patient has been as, as much part of the conversation as, as you know, we would like them to be in, in the future using evidence-based tools. So this is something that we've been very focused on at CMS. We used it in two of our national coverage determinations uh, for lung cancer screening, and the other one is escaping me right now. And I know that our quality measures group is also working in this space as well. So this is something that we're very interested in. Um, the, other, the other thing that we did with our national coverage determination was to get to some of the issues that were mentioned earlier, was trying to get the patient to discuss, I mean, it's just the whole gambit of issues that they need to, to discuss with their physician and to try to encourage that to happen. Uh, it's not just doing exercise therapy, but it's also talking to their physician about everything else that's going on. And so we are trying to do that, and then and while the reimbursement is not sky high, it is just some incentive to get it there. And then lastly, one of the things even as Medicare, where they have a 20% copay, it is something that we think about. Because no matter what treatment they get, for a Medicare patient, they still have to pay 20% unless it's screening, where the copay has been waived. So that is a significant, I think, for a patient. That is something that is as significant as they make these decisions, that sometimes we all forget that they're always, they're going to have to pay depending how expensive the particular treatment is. And I know that's part of their decision making. Um, so we do, we don't consider cost in of itself at Medicare, we only consider health outcomes in the coverage group. But I think in the back of our mind when something is really expensive, we do know that the patient, we always sometimes forget the patient is really going to be paying something out of pocket. So, Shadden, we heard a little bit from Jeff about their approach to PAD. Can you give us your perspective on this field, what, what Cardinal Health's thinking about? I'm, I'm also very curious about biologics and if that's something that uh, you guys have been looking at, cell-based therapy, gene therapy for, for PAD and CLI. Any thoughts on those two topics? Yeah, absolutely. So, 
For the first question, I would say our approach is really to look at the patient across the continuum of care. When you think about a PAD patient, pre-hospitalization, hospitalization, post-hospitalization, post what are they, what resources do they need when it comes to drugs, devices, supplies, other services, and how can we help the patient across the continuum of care? And also we take the perspective of healthcare necessitating, of course, safe devices, <clears throat> effective devices, what are the clinical outcomes and what are the economic outcomes? When we evaluate devices for acquisition, for investment, we think about how does this device provide also economic value? Does it create procedural efficiencies? Does it help decrease complications? Does it make the procedure easier in comparison to other classes of devices? So it's really those two lenses, the continuum of care as well as the clinical and economic point of view that we look at PAD and frankly, several other disease states as well. In terms of biologics, um, that's actually not an area that we work in, so I'll have to pass on that part of the question. Jeff, any interest in that area? Yeah, I can make uh, one comment. So we are doing uh, a good bit of exploratory research right now in stem cells, both adult stem cells and pluripotent stem cells. It's, it's quite early. Uh, we're embarking upon two uh, first human use trials. Uh, there's, there's definitely some challenges, both in terms of harvesting the cells, um, delivering the cells, whether it's direct or indirect. And, uh, you know, technologically, I think this is uh, early, early stage research. So many, many miles to go before we sleep, uh, so to speak, on, on stem cells. But I think you know, I'd like to envision a world that with um, reimbursement for exercise therapy, that patients come in earlier, so perhaps they can be treated earlier so that we don't see so many of these patients really at the end, at the late stages of, of CLI where they need uh, something like a stem cell type therapy. But, um, you know, maybe someday we'll get there. Two uh, individual audience people asked a similar question. I'm going to ask Doug this one. Um, the question's about dietary interventions in patients with PAD. So um, there's two, two uh, approaches to this, Doug. First of all, how do you routinely use dietary interventions when you counsel patients in the office? And then also this issue that goes back to patient and system accountability, compliance with dietary interventions. So what are your thoughts on this? Uh, perhaps I can answer the first question better than the second, but I think um, what I counsel patients is much as I would counsel a patient who has coronary artery disease about how to modify diet. I mean, if they have diabetes, there are all sorts of specific recommendations about how to manage their diabetes and ma maintain control of their systemic glucose levels. But for a patient who has atherosclerotic disease, you know, we focus on really the Mediterranean diet and uh, low fat consumption, uh, high fiber nuts as snacks. And, you know, a lot of our societies have well published uh, guidelines for patients like on the American Heart Association, and American College of Cardiology's websites where patients can refer for information. I think something that's incredibly exciting about now the reimbursement for supervised exercise is, for example, at our institution at Mass General, with our cardiac rehabilitation program, it's really a multidisciplinary um, effort where not only are the patients going to pursue a supervised exercise program, but they will receive, on a regular basis, nutritional counseling. And so, for example, when someone has the time and opportunity for direct feedback about how they make the point-of-care decisions, when you're in a grocery, do you buy 85% lean meat or 95%, or are you buying something that's different to substitute it's really kind of minute to minute substitutions. And I like to counsel my patients that it's almost like a return on investment. If you can eat something that gives you 85% of the satisfaction, sorry, yeah, 85% of the satisfaction that you might have um, as eating something that's high in fat content, but you end up with something that really doubles your return on the investment in terms of your health, then that's really just a short sacrifice for something that is a profound gain in terms of health outcome. And so the counseling that can come with a sort of uh, rigorously supervised program where people learn how to make these healthy decisions with minimal sacrifice, I think, is what is ultimately most important. How I follow up on this, you know, in talking with patients, I say, how are you doing? Open-endedly, and I think often with counseling and routine um, structure, they say, you know, this is one of the best things 
I've ever done for myself. I think that's a comment that I hear when they've been to an, a really inspirational um, sort of counseling sessions on a regular basis. So I think we have that to look forward to, actually, and I congratulate you know, the approval for supervised exercise and PAD for that. So, Tamara, this probably won't surprise you, but I've got several audience questions. So um, I'll take a couple of these, all right? Um, how does uh, CMS think about site of care? So specifically in PAD interventions, many of these are going to same-day outpatient in a hospital or an ambulatory center or an office-based facility. Does CMS have an approach to thinking about the site of care and reimbursement? Mm -hmm. uh, is this is for me or for you? This is for you. <laughs> so, uh, actually, it's a good question. So, in our proposed, I think we had a couple site of the challenge I have is I've, I have the final in my head, which I can't actually tell everybody about because it's not public yet. So, I don't want to confuse the two. But in the proposed decision, we had a couple site of, we call them site of service. And where you can where you can get the care and CMS will reimburse it. We got we got 79 comments. All of them were positive on the proposed decision, which I think is probably a first for me. Usually, I get a lot more negative than positive. Um, so, based on those comments, what we did is we took a look at the decision to see where we how, if we could expand that site of service. Uh, and so I can't really comment on whether we did or not, but so the place to be is where we proposed it. We took a look at the public comments. I think they were good public comments. And so where we thought we could do it statutorily, this is what we looked at and tried to, uh, attempted to do. Uh, Tamara, here's another one. Um, when you're faced with a coverage decision about a therapy to save somebody's leg, how do you set the bar on reasonable and necessary? <laughs> well, that's a million dollar question. Uh, so, uh, as this commenter may or may not know, we've never defined reasonable and necessary uh, in a regulation or otherwise. The only way that we have done it is we've written national coverage determination. So there is no, like Misty said about the FDA, there is no clear, well at least no de well-defined bar. So with that being said, I think what we try to do is we try to work, if there is a new innovative technology and it's something that is, there is no other treatment out there, we will work with you to try to figure out how to get there, which is why we have developed a variety of ways to try to get treatments to patients. So, you know, whether we have tried to expand on our clinical trial policy to help pay for costs in clinical trials, or expanded our investigational device exemption to pay for costs within IDE trials that are at the FDA, and we are continuing trying to be innovative so we can cover something under coverage with evidence development, whether that's in a registry or also a clinical study. So, so we really are trying to figure out what are the right outcomes, or at least trying to develop the right outcomes so that we can come to a clear, reasonable, and necessary decision. I think in this space, I mean, it really is, there is, you know, quality of life, you know, what does the patient want? And I think if, if you have the right technology, and if you come to us and you show us the data, and we think that, you know, if we have a lot of conf if we have enough confidence in that data, I think that we will cover those particular technologies. I think in this space, where we just started, whether it was, you know, supervised exercise therapy, I think, you know, there was so much data there. It was just someone telling us, you know, you need to take a look at this which we did. I mean, the data goes to 1965. We cut it off. At, we went only from 1995. That was just too much to review. But it's really just bringing it to our attention. But I'm sorry, I don't have a clear definition. Um, it's really, it could be, it's, it's, we work with you. How about that? I think that's probably a better place for us to be anyway, because technologies are moving so fast uh, now and in the next 10 years. So, uh, Matt, I'm going to have you go first and then Doug follow up if he's got additional comments. But let's go to technology a little bit deeper. So when you face a patient with CLI and, and uh, largely infrapopliteal disease, what, what are the challenges you face in the treatment and what technologies do you wish you had that you currently don't? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think... Um, as Jeff alluded to, we, we do have an array of, of technologies that are getting better and better every year. I, I'm not sure if 
Schaden alluded to it, but as a clinician who's been treating PAD and CLI for 15 years, it, it's actually a pleasure that every year it gets better and better and better, and it absolutely translates into uh, improvements for the patient and their overall kind of journey with this with this tough problem. But you know, currently we we have uh, technology that's worked well in other in other vascular beds that that is it's the below the knee space is is really a challenge. There are small uh, arteries. The analogy has been made to uh, you know how similar or dissimilar is it to the coronary uh, vasculature? Um, it, it seems to share some similarities, but but clearly different. So you know as I approach a patient, um, certainly we now have long balloons that are that are well suited to the to the long tibial arteries that in certain patients work fantastic so you might use them and then see see how things look we do not have dedicated stents they're coming there's some versions but uh, that is clearly an, an unmet uh, challenge uh, that remains so uh, I think many of us use coronary stents uh, that are short and expensive, and so to use any number of those in the in the tibial platform, uh, the the cost would be prohibitive. Drug looting balloons are certainly very um, attractive, and and are having an increasing role, and and right now are, are probably the most promising kind of technology. They have not uh, absolutely been proven to to be the magic bullet that I think uh, many are hoping they will be, but uh, I think with more time, they will, uh, they, they will be. I think a very specific unmet challenge is um, the, the, uh, the access from the wrist uh, has really transformed uh, cardiac care, and we do not have that for the, for the legs, so we typically still go from the contralateral groin or an anterograde uh, stick or retrograde access. So technology that allows us uh, to do whatever we need to do from the, from the radial artery approach, I think, is, a, is a, another unmet need. So, you know, that's a fair bet. I think we have a lot of great stuff that we didn't have just a few years before, but uh, still excited to see what's going to come around the corner. Doug, how about you? Any, any thoughts about things you wish you had that you didn't? I think Matt really summarized really nicely uh, my wish list. I'd say, um, you know, when I think about intervention for critical M ischemia, these patients are so fragile, and what you want to do is get from point A to point B and touch nothing else in their occluded extremity. I picture it like you're a jewel thief suspended by a wire above a bunch of laser trip wires, <laughs> and you just want to pluck out that crown jewel and get out of there. And so I think that when you're doing an intervention like this, I think access from transradial access would be amazing where you perhaps don't create vascular complications. But really what the charge is for us as interventionalists is getting a wire from the point above an occlusion to the point where the vessel reconstitutes downstream. And it sounds so fundamental, but it can be just so incredibly vexing and difficult. It's like passing a wire through bone or through a tooth. And it doesn't want to do that. And so the development of novel wires that will go only where you want them to go and never go where you don't want them to go would be one thing on my wish list. And I think we're getting there. Second is the education of the operator to be able to use these advancing technologies effectively, safely, and to our patient's benefit. I think thirdly, once you've passed that wire from point A to point B, which is really the hardest thing to do, there need then to be technologies that we can use to open the vessel very effectively. And I think, as Matt pointed out, these long balloons, which are inexpensive and, you know, admittedly relatively unsophisticated technologies are game changers. You inflate one balloon, and it just stretches the whole artery open in a homogeneous way, whereas before it was like we were taking little Tic Tacs and inflating them, creating disruption in multiple little segments around a vessel. This is a beautiful, elegant solution. I think, finally, achieving durable patency so we don't ever have to go back and steal that jewel a second time, I think, is what's going to be most important. And then finally, our systematic issues of just how to care for these patients in all of their heterogeneity and all of their complex medical morbidity to help to keep them alive so their limbs stay attached to their body. 
they are cared for, and they also reduce the systemic burden of atherosclerosis. I think those are the key things that I wish for. And from the technology standpoint, it would be wires, stents and balloons that keep vessels open, and something that can reach from the wrist all the way down to the toe. So um, we're getting, getting close to the end. I, I want to just throw this one out there. I suspect my government colleagues won't be allowed to answer this, but maybe others on the panel. Is anybody familiar of trials or studies on 3D printing of arteries or veins? <laughs> it's definitely happening in aortic aneurysms, right, Matt? It is, and it's... Uh, is it a game changer? I don't know, but in a given patient, it is transformative. So I have a, a young female patient with renal artery aneurysm, small, 10-year uh, history of, of hypertension who wants to get pregnant. In a normal patient, her aneurysms are so small, uh, I wouldn't treat it, but uh, knowing the exact treatment for that particular problem is very challenging. I got a 3D printout two days ago, and it just is unbelievably helpful in terms of operative planning, in terms of sharing the, the clinical problem with a, with a colleague, and going through a very sophisticated uh, uh, planning process that's just, it just opens up doors that just weren't there before. Actually, honestly, never thought about it for the tibial uh, or the lower extremity vasculature. I think our imaging is so good that we're not, it's not that many, uh, not, not that many times that we're kind of struggling to know exactly what the anatomy is. So um, there are cases alluding to Doug's um, elucidation of the challenge of certain lesions. So certain lesions, we pass a wire through and steal the jewel without much effort. And other times it's a, it's a real challenge and we, and we fail. Those are cases where maybe advanced imaging and maybe some version of 3D printing uh, that gives morphologic information in terms of calcium and density. I can imagine that might be uh, particularly helpful, but um, not sure about that. And, and what you're describing is also done in orthopedics and complex spinal deformity surgery planning as well. I'll apologize to the other questions that were asked. Uh, they're all fabulous. Uh, one about how do we get people to be more compliant with medical therapy and exercise. I've spent my whole career not being able to figure that one out. Um, a great question about durability of infrapopliteal interventions. I think this is the holy grail that Jeff and Shadden have been talking about. Um, I do want to close with uh, an opportunity starting with uh, Jeff and coming this way. Um, if you could give the audience one key message that you'd like them to take away about this area in our discussion this afternoon, what would that be? Jeff? I'd say uh, we can and need to do a better job for these patients. And I think, I like to believe, we're at the beginning of Moore's Law of uh, PAD options for, for these patients. I guess I would just pick up on something that both Tamara and, and Misty have alluded to. And, and I palpate a change in sort of the collaborative spirit of NIH, uh, FDA, CMS, industry, and academia, which is somewhat what this uh, forum is all about. But I think there's just a, a real recognition that that is a, is, a, is a process that everyone wins on, and in particular our patients. So uh, PAD, CLI in particular, is a tremendous challenge. We're not there yet. I think it's ripe for ongoing innovation and, and new technology. And our job is to figure out, you know, exactly what the innovations, where they fit into our treatment options. I think it's um, very hard to top the jewelry thief analogy, which was fantastic. But um, uh, I, I really would leave us with this challenge. When we think about these patients across the continuum of care, as they go through their diagnosis phase, their interventional phase, their post-acute phase, and then cycle through again and again, what innovations can we come up with to help patients and health systems, both clinically and economically, across this continuum of care to include the chronic wound problems as well? I'd like to continue to stress collaboration um, in order to develop uh, evidence-based literature 
So that way we, physicians and regulatory scientists, can make decisions and move this field forward. So we always tell people to come early and often, whether, whether you would be in academia, in industry, or uh, clinical practice. So uh, definitely collaboration. But I think it, it really is coming to us and, and with whatever you have and us working together to see if we can get you where you need to be. Because really the ultimate goal is the patients and really to get us out of the way so that the physician and the patients can have the conversation and give them the right treatment. I think that we have to improve public recognition that this is an incredibly important disease process. I think we need an ice bucket challenge for PAD. Maybe it's the Epsom salts foot bath challenge, I don't know. And which would probably not be good for a patient with PAD, by the way. But um, <laughs> I, I was gonna say, what did you learn, Doug? I learned it all. Learned it all from you, but um, I think that it's important for us to help our society, our colleagues that are clinicians and partners in industry and to recognize that this is just so vitally important so that we can stamp out the disease before it becomes more rampant and takes more lives, costs more money. Yeah, my only final comment, I think this has been a fabulous session and I can't thank all of you enough. Our patients need all of you here at this meeting to invest in this space. We're desperate. We've got opportunity. Our patients need it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their time. Thank you all. Thanks, Callum and Tony and Chris and everybody. Have a great evening.